When it comes to the qualities of New Jerusalem in terms of justice and reconciliation, the vehicle that we have available to us makes a difference. Amen? If I'm in a little car that has rear wheel drive, bald tires, I'm probably not gonna make it up that road. If I'm in a vehicle that has clearance, good tires, even if I have to use chains, four wheel drive, if I even have chains, I can get home. Some people don't have that vehicle. Even if the road is clear, which is part of our job, the mode of transportation, the job opportunities, the education can vary greatly. The vehicle that we ask people to take can vary greatly. God's covenant to God's people says to us in the scriptures, and this is the word of hope that carries us through all of the circumstances. God's covenant to God's people is that the kingdom of God will happen. It's not a matter of if we participate or not. It makes a difference if we participate, but we do not control the coming of the kingdom of God. Christ has already been victorious in saving us, but our receptivity to that grace is manifested in our participation. Now, how does the covenant that God promised God's people come, this new Jerusalem? How do we hear the voice crying out in the wilderness and make a difference in our lives so that the road is made plain and opportunities are offered for all, not just a few? That we see ourselves as a community and God's people as a whole the answer to this comes in John's passage. And it's when the prophet John, John the baptizer says, I come baptizing with water for the cleansing of sins, which was the Jewish tradition. But the one who comes after me that I'm preparing the way for will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And that, my friends, is all the difference for us. It is through the Holy Spirit and through our identity as children of God and remembering what it means to be children of God that we can address the questions of justice, forgiveness, and reconciliation. That we are not just reconciled to one another, which is part of the equation, but that we are reconciled to God. I invite you to find your closest prayer book in your pew. It's the red book, <laughs> has, a cross, has a cross on it, <laughs> and open it to the section of 293 and bottom of 293 and 294. Many of you will be familiar with this. It is the renewal of our baptismal vows as part of the Easter vigil service, which takes place at the cathedral for us. But whenever we do a baptism, we renew our vows too as a congregation and we remember what it means to be children of God, living our lives with hope and witness for this new Jerusalem. And there are two little questions here. One is at the bottom of 293 and the other is the next page. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And answer with me, please. Our answer is, I will, with God's help. It is with the God's help part that John the Baptist, crying out in the wilderness, calls us to remember. Will you see, conserve Christ in all persons, and then we need to remember that that is not something that we do all by ourselves, but that we ask God's continual help for. And then on the top of page 294, 
Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? And again, our answer is, I will. <laughs> Michelle Alexander has written a wonderful book called The New Jim Crow. It is about the business of mass incarceration. She addresses on one hand that people definitely need to take responsibility and that we have laws for a reason. And she also draws our attention to a history of making a business out of criminalizing people. She gives some basic statistics I want to share with you. She mentions three groups, white, Latino, and African-American in terms of being incarcerated. One in 106 white men, and she just talks about males in this section. One in 106 white males will be uh, incarcerated sometime during their life. One in 36 Latino men, and one in 15 African-American men who are, constantly, who are uh, currently incarcerated are African-American men. So currently, one in 106 white men, one in 36 Latino, one in 15 currently incarcerated. These are as of 213, 213. But she also offers this clarification, that one in three black males in their lifetime will be in jail. And the question that comes up for me when I read this kind of statistic is what color is my Jesus? And so I ask you, what color is your Jesus? And let me explain. In a system where right, white privilege rules, we have the opportunity to blame the victim. We have the opportunity to do all kinds of things to keep the status quo and the power. I don't know about you, but when I grew up in church, the picture on the wall of my Sunday school room, Jesus looked more like a Swede <laughs> with long flowing blonde hair, blue eyes, and a Roman nose, whatever that is. But I don't think Jesus was that. And it's okay that there is a depiction of Jesus in many, many different forms. That is not the point. The point, though, is that we follow the one as Christians who leads us into new ground. We have to ask the question, what does it mean to honor somebody's color and race. And the great liberal misunderstanding is that if we are colorblind, then we are somehow doing people a favor, and I don't think that's good either. It just perpetuates the problem, the deep-seated issues. So the next question is, how are we praying about this? In our Episcopal and Anglican sense, we believe that praying the way we pray and what we pray shapes our believing. And so it makes a difference to ask the question, what is our prayer about this? How are we listening to the voices of prophetic truth in the wilderness? And what are we doing about it? Is our prayer enough already? Just please go away. Is our prayer, God, keep us at business as usual? Or is our prayer, thy will be done? As when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus gave them what we know and say today as the Lord's Prayer. Because when our prayer is, thy will be done, we begin to make room for God in our lives to change us, to change our actions and the way that we understand power to be distributed. 
and Barbara Brown Taylor's book that we're using for our Advent study, Learning to Walk in the Dark. If you have the book, it's on page 87. She refers to another author, Ken Wilbur, who wrote a book called One Taste. And he draws a distinction between religions that evolve and value translation of a relationship with God. And by translation, he means seek meaning in life. And not that that's a bad thing, of course, but so often, and it's a part of our Western culture, we can translate the heck out of everything until we're at the point where it's all about us. We do this many, many ways in our society and even in our churches, many of our churches. And it's very seductive and it's nothing new. It just takes different forms. But in other words, we extract meaning from Bible studies or all kinds of parts of life of the church. But the fruit is always going back to the people in that club. It's a club mentality. And we survived for many years that way. But he, Ken Wilbur also brings up that the goal of religion takes us beyond translation and just seeking meaning of an experience and relationship with God to what it means to be changed. And that's the crux of the Christian journey, that we would allow God to change ourselves, that this would not be, after all, an ego trip for us individually or corporately. And that's when John the Baptist says, I'm here because of him. And I'm preparing a way for Jesus. And when we start to pray that, look out. Other people can get up the road. We give people rides in our four-wheel drive vehicles. We find ways because God is creative. We find ways to experience the new Jerusalem together. Have some of us made an idol out of the American dream and placed it before God's dream and God's covenant? I wonder, or are we better off with Isaiah's insights about freeing the oppressed and those captive and moving away into new behaviors and new ways of organizing and managing this holy city of God that we are witnesses to? Are we better off when we put before us the baptismal vows and are reminded that we do strive, we strive, we strive for justice, real justice, and peace, real peace. And we are saints of God who are not afraid to fight for that. And how will we do this? And it will happen. We do this with God's help. Thanks be to God. Amen.